Silence. It's somewhat strange, isn't it? Silence. It emphasizes the vulnerabilities, the emptiness, the loneliness of our society. Now, if I was to tell you that silence is the leading cause of suicide, that would shock most people, right? Well, for me, silence affected my life on so many different levels many years ago. But I, I spoke up at the right time. I got the support I needed, and I recovered. Now, over 10 days ago, I was told that I'd be doing this talk today. And that got me thinking. It got me quite nervous, a little bit anxious, and slightly stressed. What would I talk about precisely in terms of mental health? How would I come across? How would I enter and start my talk today? You know, I'm not here talking about the giant monkey frog of the Amazon rainforest or quantum physics. We're talking about mental health, something that every single person in this room has. It's not a statistic that is one in four. It's all in four. And for me, it's about being authentic, about speaking from the heart, and just coming across as best as I can and sharing my story with you. Now, I'm, I'm no expert, far from it, but I'm experienced, I'm, I'm familiar with mental health. I suffer from depression. So I am grip with depression, this dehumanizing disease that takes away our personality, our happiness, our enjoyment of life. It's everything away from us. Now the symptoms. Symptoms are always quite hard to sort of get across because if you haven't suffered from depression or another mental health condition, it's hard to understand why right, and empathize with people who have. Well, actually, it's some of us might have suffered similar symptoms to what I did. Insomnia, sleepless night after sleepless night, no day to sleep. That's what insomnia is, plain and simple. Also, loss of appetite. During that depressive spell from October 2015 to about March 2016, I lost a stone in the bit. Now, I'm not going to convert it to kilograms because I don't know. But a stone in the bit I lost, which is, for someone quite his small, skinny, I suppose, and tall, but that was quite a big impact on me. So this mental health was having physical impact on my life. From the outside, this happy person within an inner battle. Now, in about March 2016, I went to the war that I took many times before. Uh, it's a war quite close to me, about one and a half miles. I took this at about 2 a.m. And I was walking on this bridge with a 70 foot drop beneath me. And it's almost like this, but on a larger scale. And cars took 70 80. The world passing by and me just stood still and thinking that this might be my way out. To end my life might end the strain, the struggle, the emptiness, the loneliness, the silence that I've been enduring. I thought that film would save it all. After a few hours of battling with myself and my word, my word, it was a battle. <coughs> I pulled myself away from the bridge. And put that down. Now that walk I did a few times, perhaps not so drastically, but that day, that day I went to kill my own life. Absolutely. And people do ask me, did you want to end your own life? And categorically, I pulled myself away, and that morning, the day after, instead of leaving with a full bag on, a uniform, and kind of brush it all over the carpet, I thought, no, no, we we'll turn that and tell your parents what happened last night. The grief, the feeling, the depression. And I told them. And I didn't block it up. I told them as frankly, and as honestly as I've told you today. 
um, that day, from the emergency appointment. I was put on crisis watch, which is sort of a health service way of controlling people in similar suicidal states and stuff. And I was on that for a considerable amount of time, asking for the support I needed. And after the cognitive behaviour therapy, CBC, I remembered that from the, the work I had on the recovery and the counselling, I began to see light at the end of the tunnel. Yes, what a cliche. What a cliche. But I did see light at the end of a very, very bleak and gloomy tunnel. And just that very simple conversation, that conversation of unburdening what was a very heavy weight of depression on my shoulders, the gas. But my recovery didn't sort of stop at the counselling and the CBT. It stopped much further, but it's still going on today. I'm recovering today. This is cathartic, I suppose, for me. Each time I speak about my mental health troubles, it not only may help one of you guys in this room, but it helps me as well. And that's why I do genuinely speak honestly and from my heart. Now, that was just my story. There were many other stories. Everyone has a story to tell. Mine was just depression and how it impacted my life. But across society, people are suffering from a variety of mental health conditions. The doctor who's struggling with their postnatal depression. The servicemen and women battling with their PTSD. The student whose anxiety is controlling every part of their life. And the elderly person whose isolation and loneliness is getting too much. Now, there's three strategies I think we can all adopt as a society to sort of build on the awareness, build on the stories, build on this reducing the stigma of mental health that we hear so often. And the three things are compassion, Connectivity and community. Good alliteration there. Thank you very much. Now, with compassion, not, not finished yet. With compassion, it's a tough one. What does compassion mean to you? Because I asked that question to myself a few days ago. What does compassion mean to you? Now, it might be someone sat on the bus next to you. It might be Someone who's the taxi man that's taking you home from a night out. It might be the person serving you at a coffee shop or a sandwich shop. <coughs> They're all impacted by mental health. And one of them might be just having a bad day on that day. It might be someone one seat away or one street away, one town away or one city away. It might even be someone at the other end of the world. But we can show compassion in a small way. Because mental health doesn't discriminate. We're all infected in some way, shape, or form. Mental health comes in many disguises, you know, many shapes and sizes too. How do we show compassion? I think it's quite simple. We use these, our ears. Let people's stories be heard. Let them unburden whatever they may want to unburden. On you. Now, I don't mean sitting there for hours and then listening to their stories, their struggles. Of course, if you've got the time to do that, but let's just be realistic. That few minutes, that few moments out of your busy schedule helps people like me. Helps people like me. You've got to imagine as well and sort of recognize in society that mental health is influenced, impacted by a range of factors. Now, mental health isn't just a label, and often, I'm sure you'll agree, people are just labeled with a mental health. I felt I was picked up with depression, sort of moved to the side, dumped, got the support, and that was it. And I think that's really true. People are impacted by the isolation, the loneliness, as I mentioned, especially in the elderly. The students with the anxiety and the stress, but what about other things? What about gender issues and concerns that people have and struggles? Or with their sexuality as well? What about learning or behavioural difficulties? All these external influences impact on mental health, our mental health. 
So let's allow people to be heard, their concerns, their struggles, and break in that silence associated with mental health. Now, number two, connectivity. We are the most connected society there has ever been, but yet we are at our most lonely. And that really gets to me. It's quite shocking how connected we are, but how withdrawn we are from society. We're a society of keyboard tappers, keyboard warriors, phone screen swipers, and social media addicts. We really are. This society, especially our young generation, has been sucked into this online dystopia that is social media. And we're losing the real connections, the real friendships that matter so much, that have built up societies for generations. And that is being lost by one of these. And don't get me wrong, I spend a lot of time on it. In fact, I looked at my screen time yesterday, it was actually quite shocking. Eleven and a half hours. Eleven and a half hours scrolling through social media. And you can actually break it down, can't you? You can break it down to the percentages you spend on networking and this and that, note-taking. No, 97% with social media. I hold my hands up. And that's the thing. We are more connected. But those meaningful conversations, those meaningful messages we can share to one another, uh, personally, interpersonal, well, that's going. So how do we become more connected? Well, in the last 60 or so seconds I've been speaking, there's been 3.3 million Facebook posts posted. There's been 70,000 Instagram photos uploaded. 440,000 tweets tweeted. And 29 million WhatsApp messages sent. Now that's quite a good statistic, I think. You know, WhatsApp and messaging is, is quite good because you're opening that dialogue. I think the others, other social medias generally can be quite isolating. Now, how can we move from this to a more personal world? And again, it's very, very simple. You know, send a message to someone and ask them for a coffee. Ask them to go for a walk with you, whatever it may be, or just give them a call. When was the last time you called one of your friends on your social media? Because I think it would have been quite a while ago. Me as well. So let's encourage more of that. Let's encourage more of the open ended discussions, the meeting face to face, and the going and grabbing a copy. So that connectivity. The third thing is community. And I'll ask you the question again what does community mean to you? For me, it's about supporting and promoting local grassroots charities, organisations, social enterprises and projects. As the old saying goes, the charity starts at home. Have a look around your community, your locality, and see what services are available for people. For people. Now what you're helping people there with is that frontline support, those charities that supported me, those charities that supported you, the ones giving the counselling, the ones out and about in your community supporting people who are struggling with their mental health, who are helping people break that silence that is associated to mental health. That I'm okay, I don't need help. Well actually come in close, I'll help you. Those people, that's who you're supporting if you get out and about in your community and support them. People say, cynics say, there's not enough funding for mental health. I agree. I agree. I'm not going to stand on this platform and say there's not enough, there is enough funding for mental health. But what my attitude is, is a can-do attitude, a get-up-and-go attitude, a let's not treat it as a problem. Let's look for the solution. Let's fund it. Whether that be baking a cake and selling it, whether that be doing a marathon if you're feeling sporty. I'm just, I am not feeling sporty, so I won't be doing that. I'll be looking at other things to do to fundraise. But find something that you're interested in and use that to raise a bit of money for a local cause. Now, I've touched upon social media and connectivity. Why don't you use your skills, your savvy social media skills, to the benefit of an organisation who are struggling on social media, who are trying to get their audience increased, who are trying to reach more people, treat more people, support more people. Use your social media skills to help them for an hour or so a week and volunteer 
or with marketing or campaigning to struggle with that one. Whatever it may be, you can use your skills to benefit that local project, supporting on the front line. And as the saying goes, and a title I thought about using for today's talk, actions speak louder than words. We all have a story to tell, and I've shared mine today. But let's do more. Let's get together. Let's harness that British spirit that we all have and support people, support the charities who are doing fantastic work. In the organisation I'm a part of, that I founded over a year ago, I thought, where's the sort of gap in the market with mental health? And I looked at funding as one of the sort of issues. But I also looked at just giving a helping hand to charities. A charity that I gave a cheque to of £750. I was thinking, is this enough? What's this going to go to? These are the things that were going in my head. Is this going to pay for anything? £750. That wasn't even 25% of their annual turnover. And you will find a charity, an organisation, a little project in your community who are struggling to make ends meet at the end of the week, who are struggling to put food on the table for their staff, who are not able to pay expenses for their volunteers. But that's £750, that's £50, that's £1,000, whatever it is, whatever figure that is, you can make a huge difference. Now, at the start, I talked about silence. And I shared my story, and I shared the fact that actually breaking my silence was the best thing that I ever did. But the recovery didn't stop at the counselling. The public speaking, the radio, the events hosting, the talking to people like you, the fantastic people out there, that is recovery. And that has really helped me. So I want to leave you with three questions. And it links to the talk today. Number one, how will you show compassion? Number two, who will you connect with? And third one, what community project will you support? Tomorrow, the next day, the next week? It's certainly food for thought. Because silence, silence is a weird word. Silence is a weird sensation too. But let's break the silence. Never, never. Leave things to say. Thank you very much.